this is a great uh, this is a great topic. And the question is, what are the top things you look at when you go to a place? So as, as a digital nomad, I've always had a list of things, right? Like, are there Han girls there? Yeah. No, are, ooh, ooh, it, can, can I walk in the city, yeah. right? Or, or uh, is there a beach nearby, right? And, and these things have, have massaged as I've, um, as I've you know, grown older and wiser and hopefully and, and, and experienced in life. But for you, it had, I mean, has it evolved this like sort of traits, good traits of a place you want to move to? Because there are people out there, especially after, you know, the pandemic and all, now they're looking for remote work and they, they, they're like, hey, I can work remotely because I just did it for two years, three years. So now they're maybe looking to go to places. And the whole world is open to people. Yeah. So how did people make a choice? There's like the practical things that you can figure out maybe before you go, which is like the convenience. Like you think you want to live in like the middle of nowhere because it's cool, but that's probably not a not the case on a day to day basis. Like literally this morning I was rushing out the door, so I like kind of dropped my laptop a bit. <laughs> like it didn't break. <laughs> But if you're a remote worker, you have like to take this to Mexico City. Oh my gosh! Exactly, the devices is your livelihood, so you want to make sure like you have access to certain things. Infrastructure, as you know, is important. So you want to have good Wi-Fi, maybe different places to work from just in case. Um, I guess another thing you can look online is like if there are other digital nomad communities within there, like Facebook group is Facebook groups are like a good place to go to start a starting point. Um, what else? I would look at climate. If it matters to you, like if you like seasons, do you not like seasons? Shoot. Oh, you want summer all year round, but even then there are seasons like there's it's very humid in Tulum or in Mexico, this part of Mexico, in Quintana Roo, maybe right. during June, July, August. Really hot. Is that your thing? You know, you want to live in the Nordic area, but it gets really cold there. Is that your thing? So, and then climate is important to be able to live your best life. We're like talking about ideal lifestyle right now, right? right? What else? Yeah, those are the things like. What about people? People. What about people? Like, how high do you put that in your list? <laughs> Pretty high. Okay. Pretty high. People, it's, for me personally, I think I had the opportunity after I left Vancouver and, like, gave myself, like, a one-year self-proclaimed sabbatical because there's no such thing as a real actual sabbatical in Canada, at least. In Europe, you get like, I think after seven years, you get like, you get, they say you can leave for, I don't know how many months and still you come back and, and that's fine. So I gave myself like a one year radical thinking that I'm going to go back to Vancouver with fresh eyes. So that and was the purpose. That was the purpose, but that didn't happen, right? Like I, I didn't really go back, but what happened during that one year was like, um, I traveled to Colombia for like six months and then went to uh, Europe and traveled all around Europe living in a van for six months, like everywhere. That's a During, big deal. That's six a, months in a van. Six months in a van. That's great. Where did you go in Europe? We followed, we as in like my, the last relationship that I was in, uh -huh. like we started in Germany, but immediately we drove out to the coast. And basically, I think we went through 12 countries, but like all on the coast at, as much as we can and a lot of cities because we were moving like every two or three days. I don't recommend it, that's but that's what we did. And I would so do this. It's cool. Yeah, I would. I would do it with someone that you know that you could do it with for sure. I feel it out. But then... um in between that as well, we flew to Israel and Beirut. Damn. So I got a little bit, ta a little taste of uh, South America with Colombia, a little taste of like Europe, a little taste of like, you know, Beirut and like, you know, Lebanon and stuff like that. And then I'm from Asia, like 
I didn't do a lot of Asia, but I'm, I'm from Hong Kong and like I've been to Japan for a little bit, um, Thailand for a bit. So I had like a taste. I know it's very different, like region to region, but I had a taste of like what Europe was like, mm-hmm. kind of like, or South America ish, like little, little enough for me to decide, give me like a, like a starting point of deciding what resonates with me. And I still resonate with Europe quite a bit. Really? So I still really want to like try living there for a year. Really? In terms of people wise. Um, but when you say Europe, yeah. right? Europe is a big place, yeah, right? And so then different. you have Eastern Europe, which is very different from Western Europe. Yeah. They're completely different planets. Yeah. And people sometimes will just say, I like Europe. But then I'm like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. do you like, you like Ukraine? Or yeah. do you like uh, <laughs> Germany, right? Yeah. Do, um, so were, was there out of these in, in six months, 12 places, yeah. was there a, or 12 countries, was there a certain region yeah. or country or city or, you know, village or whatever yeah. vibe that you were like, wow, I want to live here? Yeah. It was before I even know what a digital nomad was or is, um, but it was Lisbon, Portugal. Really? And it's just ironic that like now it's considered one of like the hotter places for digital nomads, but it had like a mix of young, modern, um, expats, uh, but old like Europe styles where you have like the cobblestones, but the cobblestones are not perfect. You know, they're a little bit run down in certain places. Um, so I would say Lisbon, Portugal, and it didn't hurt that like the Airbnb that I stayed in, the the lady that I stayed with, basically the first day she's like, as I was traveling at, at that time, I was by myself and she's like, why don't you come out for dinner with my friends and like, we'll hang out. And I met her friends and then the next day her friends are like, why don't you meet us for brunch the next day? And so like that definitely helped. And it's like people from New York, uh, Brazil, um, Asia, like just all coming together. So I do like that quite a bit. Mm. Coming back to Mexico, yeah. right? Like not coming back physically, but like the topic of Mexico. Is there a certain charm here? Or in, because, you know, we always talk about Tulum energy and, yeah. and you've been all over Mexico. You've been, you've traveled way more than we have. <laughs> so what is, is there a certain something you've learned about Mexico or if like, what are your lessons from being here for the last, I don't know, two years, more, more than two years, two and a half, two and a half now. Yeah. Two and a half. What s- sort of learning lessons that you have specifically about Mexico, but also as a digital nomad. So like someone perhaps won't make the same mistakes. Mm. What do you mean? <laughs> like for, in, for example, in Mexico, one thing I've learned is that depending on where you go, you're going to find a very different type of vibe. Like, for example, in Merida, like if, if someone were to come, come to me six months ago and say, hey, uh, uh, should I go to Merida? Yeah, I've heard it's good. You know, I heard like the guy who is, sells me raw milk is from there. He's, he loves it. Tranquilo, tranquilo, whatever. But now if they can like, no, do not go there. Like... So now this is a learning lesson. Do not go to Merida. What learning lessons do you have, if any? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, my learning lesson actually about Mexico or in general where to live actually came from my time in Colombia. Because for those six months... Medellin? Outside of Medellin, like, yeah. it would be like an hour away okay. in the mountains... So for those six months, uh, it was on a finca, like in the, in the, I wouldn't say in the middle of nowhere, but just far enough so that you can't just walk to like a grocery store or anything. Yeah. So I guess it's like a version of in the middle of nowhere. We were doing like a farm to table kind of experience. Oh, you were. Yeah. So we were hosting. That's why like you were there. breakfast. Yeah. So it was full. Okay. But from that. I knew that you want to be able to have some of the things 
that comes with like living in the city or living into proximity to things as we talked about earlier. Right. Um, and also during that time there, and I guess slash also in Europe, that not being able to speak the language super well is also a thing. So coming to Mexico, those are like the couple of things that I that I look for. You want to think to yourself like, do I want to be there because it's like, you know, it's cute because it had like a very Mexican vibe. Um, but you have to think about like your day to day. It really matters. Can you talk to people? Mm. You know, can you have a conversation with someone? Mm. Um, do you have like, again, access to like all the things that you, you need? Walking distance, same, same as you. Like I, I value that a lot too. So, so around Mexico, not everywhere I think provides that. Um, it sounds so simple, like the walking distance thing. And then, you know, it will be a bonus if you can speak Spanish, I guess. Uh, even though I lived in Colombia for six months. <laughs> like it's been like two year and a half here, but um, I haven't really quite picked it up. So I think you have to look at those things. Um, and a lot of, a lot of Mexico besides, I don't know all of Mexico, right? But like. I know, like, you know, Mexico City is really modern and, like, what's the other place called? That's with the P. Where is it? Is it in Mexico? It's in Mexico. Puebla. Puebla. Yeah. But a lot of other towns and cities is, like, quite provished, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, depends on what you value. You know, sometimes you, was, you might not be used to seeing, like, garbage everywhere mm -hmm. or, like, the drinking water, like, it's not very clean. You know, it's not very clean. You can't drink from the tap water anywhere in Mexico, but like, or you can try. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I got sick for the first time in San Cristobal. Like the first thing that the Airbnb lady said to us when we arrived is like, yeah, be careful with the water because people get sick here because they're not used to it. I'm like, oh, it's fine. We've been in Mexico for like a year and a half. Like nothing's happened. And then right away I got sick from the water. And then, yeah, I, I'm just pausing because I don't want to say like anything bad about Mexico, but that is one thing depending on where you go. And San Cristobal is very beautiful. You get to have hikes, you get to go on hikes. You don't quite get to do hi hikes with elevation in Tulum, for example. Right. But yeah, um, lessons would be like, one, there's like the romanticized version of traveling. And then uh, the other side is just take a look at maybe some of the practical things as well. Yeah. Got it. So it, it, it depends on what a person values. So maybe whatever you value, see if this place will fulfill those values. And first of all, have a list of values because the values you have about a place will be very different from the values I have will be very different from the values that a, a viewer has or anyone has. So now going back to the, the Europe trip. So one thing that I sort of, I wouldn't say like sad, but it's sort of like, it's like a soft thing in my heart that when I was in high school and college, I never went like backpacking, you know, this type of cool, cool thing. It was a weird uh, uh, thing because when, when I was in the US, um, you know, there was some like immigration issue and then. Uh, you know, my parents fucked up some document stuff. So basically they, they said, you know, if I, if I left the U S I wouldn't be able to come back for like 10 years, I would have like a ban. So we couldn't leave the U S. Um, and so unfortunately all the chances I had to travel, like going to Prague or whatever, I just couldn't do it. So there was no backpacking or any of these cool trips, but obviously now that's open. I can do it if I wish. So is that type of experience where you is six months in a van and you're going around, it's sort of like backpacking, but a bit different. What, what's that like Is someone who's never done it or someone might never do it or never travel. So what can you, what can you tell us about the experience, like how you felt while you were in a van and going to different places and seeing different cultures everywhere? Mm. 
Yeah, it's a very unique experience. Um, I never really backpacked too. Not never really. I never backpacked either. <laughs> or traveled like right after post-secondary or anything like that. I think it's quite common in, in North America where it's like, oh, well, you're finished high school or just before you get into university or just after university, before you get a job, you do like the backpack thing, yes. right? So I never did that either. Um, why did you mention Prague? Just curious. That was like a... You just... Because uh, when I was... Um... When I was in my second year of university, I was in the honors college and I was doing computer science engineering degree. So in the honors college, whoever was a part of it had the opportunity to go to Prague for one month for a hundred dollars, all inclusive, Catherine, food, hotel, everything for a hundred bucks. And I was like, fuck, damn. I Why did you I say no? Because I, I couldn't go. There was a, the, the, the papers thing. We didn't have the papers. So uh, if I would have gone to Prague, I wouldn't come back for 10 years. <laughs> so, so, so easy. Just I'm staying. I'm staying. But the minute things worked out and then I could leave, you know, I, I went to McGill, right? I came to McGill and then I was like, well, and now I, I still didn't have the U.S. paper. So I was like, well, if I leave now for grad school, I know I'm doing a Ph.D. and I'm, you know, first master. So I'll be fine. Even if I can't go back for 10 years, it's all good. And I went back before 10 years, you know, we figured it out. We got all the paper stuff. But that trip to Prague was something that I always think about and I will always remember. It's funny that you said that. Like, besides Lisbon, I would say Prague would be like the next place that I would. But now that, I'm, uh, now that we're talking about it, I am connecting the place with the people for sure. It's like an is the is the other place in Europe where I was like staying Airbnb, staying at the Airbnb place. The girl that owned it, we connected. Next thing you know, I'm hanging out with her. She's you know introducing me to her friend. So I guess that does play a big part. Yeah, I love Prague. Besides like besides the people, like I love Prague. Like it's a cool. It's like again a mix of old European, but not everything is like perfect, pristine, which I kind of like. Um, there's like graffiti everywhere. It's very so, art. Exactly. Exactly. And I like how people are so um, direct. They are. Yeah. Like Russia <laughs> or Ukraine. Well, Ukraine a little bit less. But I haven't been to Russia yet, but I was going to go right after. I spent a year in Kiev right before the pandemic, and I was going to go to Russia. I had even booked my, like, uh, university stuff because I was going to study Russian mm -hmm. at the University of Moscow, and I had, I knew where I was going to live. Like, I, I had it all planned out. One of my friends from Montreal, she was there at the time, so she was helping me out, and and then obviously none of that happened. But um, the, you, you know, Catherine, this thing about people energy this is a yeah. this is a very interesting thing because i've been double crossed and stabbed in the back by like really good friends mm -hmm. and you know supposedly trustworthy people and i made these mistakes mm -hmm. in my life and even family members who have really backstabbed us in a in a really harmful way and it's not like one but it's like several so is there a sense, is it like a feminine energy thing? What is that where you can feel the energy of something, right? Like, for example, in Tulum, there's a lot of energy healing, right? Energy detection and energy like, like, uh, um, like people can feel an energy and then look at the stars and like where, you know, where Venus is and Pluto and, and then they're like, oh, you, you're in the Venus this, and you're in the Saturn this, and they coach, you know, there's coaches like that. So wh where are you with all this stuff? Because me, coming from a very hardcore science background, we make fun of this stuff, right? We, we made fun of this stuff, like, ah, oh, energy, woo-woo, right? Yeah. However, coming to Tulum has broadened my perspective. I am not judgmental at all, even if I don't understand anything i'm not like discounting it because what the hell do i know mm. right so you coming in and obviously vancouver is also 
has that type of energy, right? The hippie energy. So it's not completely different. But what, where do you stand in this energy detection, energy healing? Yeah. I mean, I don't think the energy thing is woo woo at all. Okay. I mean, depends on, I guess, the lengths that you go with it. I don't know what the science is behind it, but like, you know, just what's, what would be a science um, behind the saying, your laugh is contagious? When someone starts laughing, you you start laughing. Or, mm. you know, um, I don't think it's woo-woo at all. Or when you're living in a close proximity, <laughs> I'm just thinking about van life again. There we go. Like in a, in a van, when you're with someone, you're in a very confined space, right? You feel the other person's energy. If they're in a, you know, not so good mood or a very good mood, that, that transfers. Um, but I don't think that's woo-woo. Do you? No, I don't. Yeah. But there is a part of me that does. Mm. Now, why is that? Because to, to, when you do a PhD and you are around those people, right? And this is one of the reasons I left because I didn't want to be around people like that. Yeah. Uh, Close-minded people, right? Very like, this is the way. If I can't prove it or if I can't see it or if I can't measure it, it doesn't exist to me, mm -hmm. right? And I'm, before I did any science, I grew up in a very Sufi culture, in a very esoteric, very... Uh, um, spiritual meditative culture like even as like as a kid i was going you know waking up at four and meditating and with my with my family yeah yeah yeah. we so the 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 sect of islam that that i belong to is is known as ismailism and smileyism and they uh, and they are i say they because i'm not like practicing anymore mm -hmm. like I, i'm not like affiliated but they are very uh sort of looking at the hidden meaning behind something Right. Whereas a traditional, like a Sunni Muslim, more conservative Muslim would, you know, pray five times a day. You know, if while you're going to prayer, if you have a bad thought or let's say, um, I don't know, something happened, uh, uh, you, you, you jizzed or something. Right. And <laughs> you have to go wash yourself again. And it's a very, very specific way to wash. Right. It's, it's called wuzu. And so like it's a very conservative type mentality, whereas the way I grew up, it was very like education is everything. Ask questions about everything. Uh, you know, don't don't just take things at face value. What is you know hidden beneath? So when I see something like energy, there's a part of me that says, well, you know, in fact, if you laugh and I laugh, I am sure there's a mechanism in the brain, and we can do an experiment. We can fMRI both of us, and we would know exactly what you know maybe there's a, a memory being encoded so a part of the hippocampus might light up or let's say you felt an, an aggressive energy so maybe your amygdala would light up because there's like there's some aggression or fear going on so there's definitely a mechanistic me mechanistic thing here but what i'm asking is like for example you know there's reiki there's family constellation like a, a dube will be here next weekend for a podcast. He's coming from Merida. And I did family constellation once with dube and uh, Fabiola, his, his uh, ex, and um, Audrey. We were there. And then me, us four did a family constellation. And during the family constellation, a part of me was like, this is so stupid. Like, what the hell are we doing? What like, is exactly family it's, constellation? It's, it's, it's very, it's very uh, uh, crazy stuff. So you go in a room and we close our eyes. And the people who are facilitating, in this case was Dub and Fabiola. Audrey and I were the students, right? We were the clients. Dub and Fabiola would enter the energy of one of our relatives. So Dub would like become my mother or become my aunt or become my, my father. And then we would put hands on each other, you know, like this, right? And then you would you would speak what comes to you, right? A very free association. What do you... you or like... Everyone. Oh, okay. Everyone is participating. Everyone. They're facilitating because they've done so many of these. But as so... So, you know, I would... And then we would be free to move around. 
So at a certain point, like, you know, I was on the floor, I was like crawling and I was like on my side, you know, Audrey was doing the same. And then at a certain point, you know, I was with Audrey and I, you know, I was like this with Audrey. She was like this with you. And she's like, Farhan, I feel uh, uh, the energy of my ex in you right now. Right. And, and, and I can feel like all the things he did to me and all the torture. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> sure. So, but there was a part of me because Martha's done it too. And she had a great experience. She, you know, she, she's like bought in to that. So I wonder because there's a part of me that is closed to it. Like, oh, this is complete BS. What are you talking about? Are you serious? But then there's a part of me, the feminine part of me that is like, hmm, maybe there's something extraordinary here because we have, we experience so many coincidences, Catherine, in, especially in Tulum, so many insane things have happened where like literally four days ago, four or five days ago, Marta thought of Manuel. Manuel was one of our friends from Digital Jungle. And uh, I had mentioned that I saw Manuel, like I waved to him and then, and uh, that's Manuel Street where he works. And we also know that we were about to go to his restaurant to, to eat in, in a couple of days. Uh, last night, we invited you and unfortunately couldn't come. And Manuel showed up. Right, like right then. Right. And this is not one time. This has happened in my life so many times where I'm like a part of me, that science part of me is like, Farhan, forget about it. Ignore it. Bullshit. There's a, it's a coincidence. It's like one in X chance and the probability was met. It's not zero chance. So that's what I'm asking. Do you have a feeling about this, like a, some beautiful feeling that you get, which is undeniable? I do, for sure. I also feel like I wonder if everything can be eventually explained by science. We're just not there yet. So I think I am open, for sure. Um, and I guess it depends on where I am. I find in, in my life, sometimes I think when I'm in like a lower place in my life, I'm feeling, you know, a bit of depression or what, or whatnot. And I can't, I can't figure it out in here. Like mentally, logically, I just can't figure out the solution out. And then I surrender, right? And then I surrender. And I look to higher power, whatever it is for you. And that brings me a lot of peace. Or, and that peace brings me out of that depression. So there are moments like that. And like, I mean, the, the, the coincidence of whoever you think about shows up like that. I feel like everybody can, can relate to that. Um, so. When you're telling me about your family constellation experience, I'm like, wow, you were very open. Like for me, that would also be, I would also be very skeptical for sure. So I think it depends on like, yeah, how open you are mm -hmm. to whatever that situation is. Like I've held like little mini women's circles before. I did one with, it was Marta there, maybe Marta. I know she did a meditation with you. She told me. Oh, she did. I wonder if it was the did. one, does she? Uh, oh, yeah. It was a guided meditation. Oh, yes. That was guided meditation. I wonder if that one was the one where, uh, where we go back to uh, ourselves as a child, though. But there is one where, like, as a guided meditation where we take ourselves back to our younger self starting as a baby. And then it, throughout the guided meditation, it progresses and you kind of like think about like the milestones of your life, like in different stages. And then ultimately it gets to a point where you're meeting your younger self in this meditation and that younger self would say something to you and you would say something to them. Um, and I found it very profound a couple of times that I've done it. Um, but again, it's like, you gotta kind of use your imagination, right? Um, you have to be open to using your imagination to go there. So I don't know, is that imagination? I don't know. Mm. 
imagining my inner child yeah. is it's very helpful and I can easily do it right like I remember when I saw Martha's childhood photos right like as uh, she was probably uh, I don't know 10 12 and I was like you know Martha I can I can see me playing with you as children I can imagine that. I can for sure imagine it in, in the grass, you know, playing with the ball or kicking the ball and stuff. And I know that when I saw, I was watching a lot of trauma videos, right? So I saw the podcast with uh, Dr. Paul Conti. He did one with uh, Tim Ferriss. He did it with Andrew Huberman. Um, and then I saw uh, Gabor Mate, who's a very trauma guy and psychedelic. I love uh, Yeah, Gabor, he's amazing. I have his book right there, Myth of Normal. Yeah. And... Um, so I, I was watching this and then I started imagining little Farhan around me all the time. During breath work, he would be there sitting, right? And that practice of forgiveness, right? That, and, and also sometimes he'll be like talking to me like, yo, dude, come on, man. It's all good. Come on, look at me. Everything is good. Everything turned out great. That's funny that you said that. I feel like a lot of people expect like when they go through that process, they'll be the one saying it's all good to the younger self. But I've heard, including myself, it's the other way around. Your younger self tells you it's all good. It's okay. And then you're the one that's apologizing to your younger self. And then, yeah. As you were speaking, I just thought that because you were asking, you know, what what are my feelings around all this like spirituality stuff and woo stuff? And I think whether it's like family constellation or like breath work, I think what happens is that as we grow up, we have all these layers and walls and things and experiences that's built up. And I think whether you're in a ceremony of whatever it is, breath work or whatnot, you're kind of unlocking that. You're kind of like just getting out of your own way and letting whatever comes through and those things are just tools so again i feel like that's a little bit more like sciencey than woo woo if anything you know um whether it's plant medicine breath work you're getting to a place where you're comfortable enough to get out of your own way Got it. to feel especially for men maybe to feel the emotions. To be vulnerable. To be vulnerable. To be vulnerable about how you feel now, not vulnerable talking about how you were vulnerable in your experience. Uh, you know, when I was 30, uh, blah, 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 this and that. But like- In to, the moment. In the moment. Got it. In the conversation. Yeah, how are you feeling? now that's the key i think so i think like i meet people sometimes and they talk about their past and they are being vulnerable they're opening up their past but what touches them the most is when they talk about how they're feeling now today and i think i do that same too probably sometimes it's a very good point kefren Sometimes I talk about my childhood and I open up and I'm like, I'm being vulnerable. But as soon as someone asks me, like, how are you feeling today? I think that's when I'm like, oh, like break down sometimes. I'm like, not so good, actually. Yeah. Is that easy for you to say to someone? Because in the West, from our culture, we've been trained to be like, hey, what's up, man? How are you doing? Oh, everything is good. Even though it's not. Mm. Whereas in certain other cultures... If you ask, you will know what this person is exactly feeling because how are you is not common in, mm -hmm. in a lot of cultures, right? But in our culture, we say, hey, how are you? Hey, everything good? Even in Spanish, right? We say, hey, todo bien, or hey, como estas, whatever. So do you have a tendency to actually tell people how you're doing? No, oh, it was definitely not a tendency. It was definitely something I had to learn. I think I only learned to do that like a few, like a few years ago, really. I think it was a mix of like, like you said, um, in 
I don't know. I, I might be, this might be wrong, but like in the North American culture, yeah, you tend to want to just like be happy, go lucky yeah. all the time. And then there's also like, I still have a lot of my culture from just growing up in Hong Kong, only until the age of six. But even when I went to Canada, I was still surrounded by a lot of people from Hong Kong. So, mm-hmm. and just within my family, I guess, we don't talk about our emotions. Like that's a very uncommon thing. I see. So it's like a mix of both. Mix of like happy-go-lucky all the time and we don't talk about our feelings. So it was up until a few years ago when asked, someone asked me, how are you? I give them my to-do list. Like, what did I do <laughs> today? Oh yeah, work was this and I did this. But it was never like how I felt about it until someone like points it out to me. Mm. And even then, I would tend to like uh, not tell them the bad feelings or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm just labeling them as bad. They're not feeling sad or anything. It's not a bad feeling. It's just a feeling. Um, but it wasn't until I think I met up with my sister a few years ago. She lives in Copenhagen now. And it wasn't until then because we are five years apart. So n- now she's th- in her 30s. I'm in my 30s. We're both in our 30s. Um, she started to talk to me in a different way, right? And I started to open up to her in a different way. But that was the first time she's like really pointing it out to me every single time. And that's when I realized how often I was doing it, that when someone asked me, how am I? I just give them my to-do list versus like how I'm feeling. Yeah. Do you have a tendency to do that too? Actually, I wanted to ask you, how about we have a moment of in the, in the present vulnerability, Ooh, right? And I'll start, I'll start. Geez. It's all good. Um, because I, I would like to start cause it would, it would be harder. It's so um, hard, right? Yeah. It's interesting. So because I just started the podcast very recently, when I'm in a, in a, in a recording like this, even though I know that this is my natural, like my, my natural thing. This is like what I'm born to do. I know that because the experience isn't there in a formal, you know, formal, whatever this like podcast mm-hmm. setup thing, I'm always bouncing between being in the moment, right? Like, cause I want to be in the moment with you. I want to be like here. Yeah. Nothing else is going on yeah. versus making sure that all the stuff that I want to cover gets covered. Mm. So in a normal conversation, it would be not exactly like this because here, as I'm talking to you, it's, I want to do the podcast, a, a, a justice, like get some awesome, awesome content. But on the other side, I just want to talk. I just want to be like real, you know, like just be real here. There's no, uh, like if we feel depressed or if we feel trauma, just say this. This is the this is the this is the fact yeah. in the moment. So this is in the moment with you here. I want. I wish that I could just have a conversation like in, in the normal world, right? Because the 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 ambiance and the the set and setting, as they say in the psychedelic you know field, does make a difference. So sometimes the vulnerability truth may come out better in this type of setting, but sometimes it may not. It's hard balance. Your turn. Wait, I'm going to ask you a question then. Oh, please. Uh, how are you feeling now? How are you feeling today? I'm feeling very grateful, for sure. And this is because I get to do something I love right? With, with an amazing person in front of me, I feel very honored that this exists right now. The fact that like we are looking at each other's eyes and we are able to provide some benefits, some value to whatever, plus each other, because I'm learning a shit ton from you. And there's, and it's not just like knowledge, it's the energy right? We're becoming better friends, right? We're connecting more. Like I've never had this type of conversation with you. So I feel lucky in the moment. 
You work hard for it too. Just. The... What are your thoughts around that? Do you feel like I worked hard for this? Like I dodge that usually. Mm. I try to dodge the work hard thing because it's like a little ego in there. Like, oh, look at me! I worked hard. I look at it from another perspective. I had the opportunity to work hard. A lot of people don't. True. Right? A lot of people they might be working in the field all the time, or they are, uh, you know, they're they're like slaving, right? They're like the 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 children in China who are like slave labor, or in India, and so they they may not even have the ability to work hard for themselves, for their own future. So the, I again back to gratitude the fact that i was in a lab you know doing the experiments that i so love and i had the opportunity to do that i mean i'm very grateful that that's that's how i feel about like the hard work you know yeah i feel that from you that's true yeah so i don't let the concept of hard work like get in my head um because i had fun Catherine. like it was like i like studying i mean i love studying to be honest like i'm still reading i mean like, you see these books i'm reading them like I, I today i was reading a a paper by harry harlow uh who studied the um so he was the guy who figured out when you are taken away from your mother at childhood he did it with the monkeys the macaques in the 50s and 60s. And then he would like keep them in solitary confinement for six months. And then he would bring them back. And then he would give them a choice. You know, do you want to go to the mother with milk, who's uh, with a wire uh, design? Or do you want to go with the mother that's furry and can give you like physical comfort, but doesn't give you milk? And then he did all these experiments. And so I just love learning. Mm -hmm. And I love the intellectual pursuit of knowledge. So... I, I, none of that, like I, you know, like hard work. It was kind of like not that hard, you know. <laughs> it wasn't that hard. Yeah, yeah. I do feel like the gratitude exuding from your energy right now. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and 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 speaking of gratitude, um, when I met you in Italdo, mm -hmm. I, I believe you were you had come to. Uh, uh, Tulum for like a day or two and we were about to leave for Merida and you were in Italdo you were you know on the thing and then I was like oh hey Catherine I, just like what a coincidence like what a great coincidence and you were working on your journal yeah. right you were writing it down and you showed me stuff and it was really cool so there are a lot of gratitude journals everywhere right we know people do like the there's like the five minute um meditation, like I think one of the Tim Ferriss recommendations, uh, you be like free association, right? Or like a three minute something. Um, what, what is missing from journaling today? Right? Mm -hmm. Be it gratitude. And, and I mean, I saw a lecture by Huberman on the science of gratitude. So he talked all about like the, the, the neuroscience of it and all the studies with the gratitude. But from your experience, because you love to provide people with tools that they can write on and type on which can make them you know more productive or more grateful and more successful is there something missing that that you can sort of add to um i think i think there's so many uh not so many there are journals out there these days where it's like the I love the five minute journal, nothing against them, but it's like five minute journal or like a line a day or something like that. I think there's like a little bit of a hurry to just do the thing and get, get the thing done and check it off your list. Like I journaled today versus like, versus like, um, actually making it a ritual of some sort and like taking the time to really reflect. Maybe prompts can be, this is like, everybody has their own flavor, right? Like yeah. for me, I, I would like the prompts to be a little bit more specific. 
maybe what one can do is like if they get a like really generalized prompt um that could just be an inspiration for them to ask themselves a question because no one really knows what you're going through better than yourself in that moment uh -huh. so when i journal these days i tend to ask myself a question maybe something that's um relatable to the current situation like the yesterday i just journaled to myself as like a week weekend journaling prompt to be like what were the major emotions that stood out for you this week what are some of the major emotions that you felt um so i was honest and it'd be like jealousy anger right um and then kind of just like jot down why you feel that way or what made you felt that way but then i also do like the quickies right because <laughs> because you do you do want to be productive i guess at the end of the day so i also do like wins um it was wins i didn't want to use losses mm -hmm. what did i say? okay i said wins and i said misses wins misses and then how you want to improve the next day but just in point form like three or four points and by the time you write out your misses and you get to your improvements you can look back and basically counter that. But the misses are, um, it evolved into misses. First, I was like, what's the opposite of wins? I guess losses? Why sounds so, loser? I know, I know, that sounds so bad. Another one that sounded kind of bad was like, oh, it's regrets <laughs> or like, what were you frustrated? Like, what were you disappointed? I put, I put like disappointment. And these things, I guess, do sound like kind of like depressing, but it is kind of like how I felt sometimes. Like I felt disappointed in myself because of these things, right? Um, but I felt like maybe Mrs. was a little bit more gentler. And then just going back in point form, how can you be better the next day? So those are my quickies, wins, misses, and improvements. And then like the longer form would be like, oh, let me ask myself a question and do like a longer reflection. I don't know if this is what's missing out there in journaling, but I do see like very repetitive prompts or like the five minute, the one liner a day, just to kind of get that journaling habit out of the way. Yeah. Gotcha. So for me, writing, um, I've always been writing something right? Like a journal or something at night or whatever notes in a book, right? I wrote a lot of stuff. Like a diary? In the, in... I had a diary for maybe three or four months, like a legit with a key and all that, you know, like yeah. cheesy stuff. But it, but I had it and, and I was writing in it regularly. But now what I've started doing in, in, the, in the present day uh, very rigorously is writing blogs, mm. blog articles. So the last, so I've, I've written three so far. The first one was my autobiography. And I didn't, I didn't let my thoughts come in. There was no thought. It was just 100% transparency. Who the hell am I right now? What am I? Not my accomplishments or none of that stuff. What am I right now? What is actually valuable for me in my life? So I wrote my autobiography and then I thought, um, there was, uh, there was a video I made, uh, which was called why I went bald <laughs> in, in August of uh, 2021. And there was a very specific reason. And I filmed the whole thing and how I shaved my head or the whole thing. And a lot of people loved it, a lot of engagement. And then, uh, we put that video on YouTube and we had a lot of engagement, like a shit ton of comments. And then I was like, okay, this is an important thing. But when you video, you can't the level of vulnerability in a video versus writing, I'm not saying one is more than the other. They're just different. They're different. Writing and talking, they're, yes, they're both like thinking, right? Because um, there's a, a, a podcast I saw with Eric Jarvis, who's a Johns Hopkins professor. And he said that when we read something, the larynx has, a, has vibrations that are equivalent to us saying that literally saying that and thought 
reading, talking, they're all very similar processes. So for me, I wanted to know if I write something in which I'm very vulnerable, right? So my, my blog was 10 lessons I learned from going bald in my 30s, which is not even like, like it's not totally what the topic is, but I wanted to be as vulnerable as possible when it comes to what insecurities I had about my hair. Oh, my dad is bald, so I'm going to go bald one day anyway, right? Like all these really hard to talk about things. Yeah. And I wrote the whole thing, was incredibly honest. And some of the stuff in there will probably not, I wouldn't say probably, it could hurt mm -hmm. either my company or my brand because people are like, oh my God, look at this guy, he's a fraud. Oh, he, he tricked us. Yeah. But... I don't care because my honesty and transparency is more important than X yeah. and you fill in the X, whatever you want. Yeah. So now Catherine, me writing and the, the, the third one was uh, the eight quotes by Marcus Aurelius in meditations that changed my life. And they literally did. So I wrote that and I was extremely straightforward in, in that. And, and the feeling I got after writing, I was so light. I felt like a huge burden off. So nowadays, writing has become a gift mm. for me. So when I see you getting excited about the journals that you're creating that, that allow people to have certain benefits, it, it gives me so much faith in that. Yeah, it's such a personal it can be a very personal process, right? Writing. And I do see what you meant by like, it's very different. I think naturally when you're speaking out loud, that's how we communicate with other people, right? So even if you're just videotaping, there's like a part of you that's like, I'm talking to people, right? Whereas like writing, even, even as a child, like that's a very just you and your paper and your pencil or iPad or whatever <laughs> these days. But yeah, I get that. I think like I started journaling when again, I guess I was again, and I was at a stage in my life when things weren't going so well. I'm kind of like um, downplaying it, but I was going through like a depressive state. So that's when I first learned about Artist Way is like a book by oh, Julia Cameron. Yes. And Rick Rubin talked about her. She coined the term of... Uh, I think she called it a brain dump. No, she called it morning pages, which is basically right. the ba right. which is basically a brain dump. Um, so that's my. I mean, I diary. I I had it kept a diary just like you, one with like a lock when I was a kid. And who knows? Like probably I was just writing about boys and like how my best friend. I don't know back then, best friends forever. <laughs> but yeah, as an adult, that was my first time at experience journaling as an adult the morning pages and what it is is basically in the morning is like a stream of consciousness right you just even if you don't have anything in your mind and you just write blah 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 even if it's that or you write i'm not thinking about anything gotcha. but you're committing to write long-handed three pages of whatever and then you'll find yourself eventually talking to yourself, even if you had nothing in mind in the first place. And again, like this is just a tool, just like breath work or whatever it is that you're creating. In this scenario, you are creating the space for yourself to unlock whatever it is that's blocking you and letting that inner dialogue come through. So just like you, like writing became like a more personal and like an insight to what's really going on with myself like when you asked you were about to ask me how am i feeling now because i asked you the same you thing it. because it takes me a while i'm oh, like i forgave you you know oh, good. it would be because i think in many ways i'm still learning how to answer that or it would take me a moment to like i think i would need to do some breathing exercise to really answer that honestly 
because sometimes I think I go go through my week without actually even checking in with myself. So it would be a reflex. It would be like a reflex response to your to your question. If you ask me, mm-hmm. how am I feeling today? I'll probably give you a very maybe surface level, not because I'm not open and want willing to be vulnerable, just because honestly, I don't think I've had enough time to to reflect. How do I really feel? I might have to journal about it. Even journaling about it, it might start to look like, what did I do this week? Yeah, so I like to keep, I like to ask questions to other people to help them maybe reflect and dive deeper. And I also realize I need to do that with myself too. So if you had asked me right now, I'd be like, good. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Speaking of content creation, yeah. this is this is a really good topic, Catherine, because I heard uh, Chamat Palapatia, he's like this billionaire dude. He used to a part owner of the Golden State Warriors. He's very, very helpful to people, you know, gives a lot of advice. And he, there's basically two things that I learned from his podcast with Lex Friedman. One was define success your own way. Don't let society tell you what success is. Whatever your definition is, that's truth. And uh, the second thing he said is create content, Mm. period. Tell who you really are and then let things just happen. Because he said that the future is not in the news channels, it's not in Netflix, it's not in YouTube, it's not in, it's in people. It's in like, like Mr. Beast, for example, right? Most subscribers on YouTube, you probably watch a couple of his videos, yeah. So Mr. Beast, I don't know who the hell Mr. Beast was, because I never watched his video, nor, nor do I care about like, oh, you know, whoever gets the handoff last will win a, you know, the car, like, I don't care. But a shit ton of people care about that. So then I started looking into him. I saw his interviews. I saw his couple of his interviews. I also saw a couple of his videos and I was like, okay, this person just got a billion dollar valuation and got offered a billion dollars to buy his brand. And he said, no. So a person who has basically zero education, formal, doesn't really have an expertise in anything except YouTube and he nailed it Mm -hmm. and he studied the algorithm. He measured every single thing, every single tool that he could use, had an amazing group of people to work with and his ability to provide content that people care about is like top of the world. Mm -hmm. So for you, what has been your experience with content creation and podcasting? Is it hard for you? And, and, or does it flow? It's hard when it, you're, it's hard when you're talking or trying to create content that you don't feel, uh, drawn to or resonate with. But if you are, then it's easy. I think what works really well is like, if you're, if you align your personality with your purpose then I feel like nothing can really touch you, but it's a hard thing to do. Um, It's a very hard thing to do. And I think also don't take the word purpose so heavily. You know, I think people like put just so much emphasis on like finding that one purpose where I think like purpose is dynamic and you could have like many different purposes in life throughout your life. That's my personal opinion. Some people still believe that like you only have one purpose in life. Maybe you have a North Star, maybe a very like overarching one. Uh-huh. My purpose is to help people. But then within that, I think you throughout life, you have different chapters and seasons in your life with like sub purposes, <laughs> subcategory. Mm-hmm. But the main thing is to align that with your personality. Now, it, I feel like it, that's different because difficult because it takes time to even get to know yourself. So if you can do that, then it becomes easier. And 
I'm trying to stay away from the word passion. <laughs> but I think anything like when it comes to passion and purpose, maybe it's just something that just lights you up. And it goes back to what you were saying about maybe Mr. Beast. Maybe he just created content that lights him up, that he feels enthusiastic about doing, even though if it's a lot of work. Yeah. Got it. Have you found your purpose? I think I was totally and maybe am still the type of person that puts too much emphasis on purpose. It's, a, it's a, something that I have to keep reminding or maybe unraveling for myself. I think I was maybe told some kind of story when I was growing up that you yeah, have one purpose, mm -hmm. one big purpose, and you need to dedicate yourself. Or to maybe that. a better question is gift. Mm -hmm. Is there a gift? Um, I don't know if you've uh, read any of David Data's work. David Data is, is, is more of a, I guess he's more for men. Uh, he wrote the book, The Way of the Superior Man. Yeah. And in that book, over and over, he talks about deep inner purpose deep inner purpose and i've been listening to this this thing since i read the book in 2014 so almost 10 years ago and uh, i recently ordered it so i can like read it for the third time because i feel like i need to read david data again and it's his concept is you're always going to be looking to have things help you like let me buy this to make me feel better. Let me get in this relationship to make me feel better. Or let me get into this addiction to, to make me feel better. If you don't, if you're not following a deep inner purpose, and for him, it's a gift. There is a certain gift that you are born to give to the world, and you have to find the gift. Yeah. And, and maybe your gift can be applied to a lot of different things too, right? Um maybe this is my upbringing so odd sometimes to talk about myself in this way but I guess my gift would be um the ability to hold space for people to be vulnerable with themselves or help them reflect um I'm actually trying really hard right now not to throw questions at you one after another I think that is something that I naturally do because I have a very genuine interest in people and an interest to see like let's let's explore together if you know there's more there for you um so I guess that would be like I don't know if that would be called a gift but it is yeah this is a gift and and Martha and I have talked about this very very thing <laughs> every time that I've had an interaction with you, be it Digital Jungle or Italdo or here or you know downstairs or wherever, I always get this sense of I'm safe with you. Like I'm good with you. You allow me to be free. And this is a great gift because this means I can trust you you're not going to like tell my secret to people if 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 i cared like you would you're not going to tell and and Catherine, there is a deep empathy that i can feel in you honestly there's something where i know that you're not just saying things you're actually feeling them because you care yeah yeah no it's it's true i think that's what i meant by like um so that's my gift or anyone else also has this gift. And I guess it's like, where do I apply that to, Awful. you know, um, am I holding circles? Am I creating content or am I doing all the things? Like, where do I channel that to um, right now? My profession is a copywriter, right? Not doing too much of that in that space. I do like it. Because I guess I can use like my uh, level of empathy when it comes to writing for copy for ads or, or websites. 
And now with like the AI tools like ChatGPT, <laughs> oh, because man. I'm good at, uh, I just had a lot of practice in terms of like asking people questions. Uh -huh. So then I can like maybe prompt ChatGPT a little bit better in order to get like the answers I need from call ChatGPT a her. <laughs> Great. I've like already developed this <laughs> relationship with ChatGPT. So, yeah, so I am using, I guess, my gift in that way. But I think ultimately, and I don't, ultimately, I do want to be able to use that gift fully, whatever that means. But I think that would develop over time. Mm -hmm. Now you, you said current profession copywriter, which I know, and, and, and I'm glad you said that. And in the past, you've also done design work from what I remember. Like when you first came to Digital Jungle, you mentioned something like that, like some, some kind of design art, some like creating blogs and that, that work. And that's also creative work. Copywriting is creative work, holding circles and, and co cre creating content. This is all creative work, right? When you read The Artist's Way, that's a, it's a book about, you know, I haven't read it, but I'm assuming it's about creativity. Yeah. How does, what is creativity? Like, how does it emerge into people? And, and how does, is everyone creative or some people are, some people aren't, or like nobody really is except like one out of a million? I think everybody is definitely creative. Creative doesn't have to be drawing music what are the things that come to mind by like drawing music writing um whatever a t uh, stereotypical artist is but anything that you create even like a scientist um anything is being creative we all have like an imagination you're creative yeah. um is it either is a matter of like uh maybe some people are creative privately maybe they share it with other people Maybe they just keep it up here, but they don't channel it that onto a physical thing. We're all mm -hmm. creative, though. But it was funny when you were, like, naming all those things that you know of me. And I do believe, like, this goes back to when you were asking me, do I believe in, like, a higher power, like, a, what my thoughts around spirituality? I do believe that eventually, at some point, I'll look back and see all those dots connect. Right? Because you were saying, um, well, when I first met you, you were doing some kind of like artsy stuff, right? Well, that dot, I think, connected to the dot when I was younger. I was actually very much in art, into art when I was in high school. But by the time, uh, like grade 12, just before I graduated, I had a chat with my art teacher. She's like, why don't you go to art school? I'm like, hmm, interesting. And then I had a chat with like my friend and my parents. And they're like, finance. I'm like, that makes sense. And <laughs> I just go to finance. <laughs> but I like I I always go back to like art somewhat a little bit. And I think the art part, I'm just connecting the dots right now from what you were saying about me. <laughs> I think the art part comes from my ability to observe. I can like look my my way of being artsy and creative is like being able to look at something and replicate that like visually um, through pen and paper. And also I think my ability to feel empathy as well is also kind of based on observation, like in inten intense observation, right? So I think like all the dots kind of connect. I don't know where it's gonna lead, but I'm sure it'll lead to somewhere at some point. <laughs> The fact that, I mean, I can relate completely to the parents thing, right? Because uh, when I was thinking of going to university, my parents were like, you're going to become a doctor just like your dad, right? My dad's an anesthetist. So he's like, okay, you're going to become a doctor. And I'm like, okay, okay, whatever. Sure. I mean, I, lo I love to study. So it doesn't matter what I become. Like, I I'm going to be good. So I started uh, in, in bio, like pre-med and, and my undergrad. And my first semester... God knows what, what, what happened, but there was this like big 
dot com boom at that time. This is uh, 99. Yeah. Right. And uh, so then my parents are like, you know what? You got to do computer science. <laughs> and I was like, okay, great. Like, I don't care. Like, I'll do that. So I, I never really felt that there is this thing about purpose or passion or self-awareness. Like, I had no idea. I just knew I love to study. I like to, you know, I like people telling me I'm smart. Uh, I have my ego stuck in this big time. So I was like, oh, sure, I'll do computer science. I mean, I did programming in high school. I, I learned Pascal and like, I, you know, I, was, I did mid A's. I'll do computer science. So I switched from biology to computer science my first semester or right after my first semester. And, and now, like, if I look back at that time and if I, if I were to tell my parents that, oh, you know what, uh, I'm going to go into music. Hell no, that wasn't going to happen. There was no way. Because when I was in high school, I, for some reason, like, I don't know, maybe it's like the, the size of my hands or something, but I could like really catch a football, like better than most people, right? So I made wide receiver for my high school football team. However, that first three, four weeks, I made my first B. Ever. Ever. And this wasn't a B in a report card. It was like a quiz or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't like traumatized. I was just like, okay, I made a B. Whatever. Okay, I'm having fun. And I was playing a violin in band. So I also participated in that. And then my parents said, there's no way. You're going to get out. So I got out of the football team. I got out of band and, you know, started the, the, the track of straight A's again. Wow. So, so, so that was the, the, the sort of like, I want my kid to be successful and success equals doing something in science or engineering or, or you know, whatever. Uh, business, like finance types. I guess maybe not business, but like finance would be, it's like a science basically, or it's like mathematics. So I do super resonate with what you said. What is your relationship with that? The fact that your parents sort of massaged you into something. Or do you believe they did? Mm. I think they tried. <laughs> okay. I think they tried, but at the same time, they weren't really around enough to really <laughs> accomplish, <laughs> accomplish that. So, yeah. My thoughts around that is... Um, I'm glad they tried. I don't know. I don't have any regrets with like the road of I've taken. Actually, I take that back. That's not true. I think we all. There's like a saying. Um, what's his name? Christopher Hitchin. He once said that we must choose our regrets. Like we all have regrets. And I believe that more than I don't regret anything. I think it's more like, I, I think there's always something that we wish. Maybe if we're going to be honest, happen. right? Yeah. If, honest. if we, maybe we should have done differently. How can you not? If you know better, you want to do better, right? So if you know better, how can you look back and not be like, I could have done that better. And I think that is the point. It's not about not having any regrets. It's just like mm. learning from them. Um, so it is okay to have regret yeah I think we all do I think I if we don't but I think just people associate regret with not being happy with where they are now which is two different things yeah I could still regret but still be happy where it's gotten mm -hmm. me Okay. Yeah. Because the most people's argument against this regret thing is them. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, if I was to do that, then I wouldn't be what I am today. Mm -hmm. This is basically the the main argument of of why we shouldn't regret anything. Yeah. But what you're saying is there is a feeling of regret, not mathematicizing it, or like you know some some objective thing. But there's a feeling of ah, 
um, could have done that. That's a true feeling. It is. I think so. It doesn't mean that you're not happy to where, be where you are now. And it's true. Maybe if you did take another path, you wouldn't be where you are right now. But that does not diminish the things that you appreciate around you. It does not diminish your relationship with your partner or, or whatever sure. it is. Sure. Yeah. I get it. I get it. So I don't like um, whatever path my parents try to push me towards and I try to maybe kind of follow. You know, I did go to BCIT. It's like a, what do you call it? A post-secondary uh, organized institution mm -hmm. in British Columbia, BC. And uh, I did take uh, financial management for like a year and a bit before I switched to marketing. So um, even that, like, I don't regret it. Oh, sorry. I keep on saying that. See, it's just the same. <laughs> They got us. They They got programmed us, us man. That's <laughs> not <laughs> completely programmed. That how to say things. Yeah, exactly. I don't regret it, or you know, just always try to have the happy-go-lucky thing. What was the other one we just talked about? Um, like being vulnerable in the moment. Being vulnerable in the moment. So many things that we just kind of like are still programmed. Oh, the purpose thing. How I'm still kind of like, what's my one and only purpose in life? And if I'm not 100% sure, but I guess I don't have a purpose. Like, I'm still unraveling. Yeah. I want to go back to this introverted, extroverted thing because it's very interesting to me. Energetically, when I'm writing a blog or when I'm uh, making content, you know, just like a podcast, solo cast, just me, right? or if I'm reading a paper, so on and so forth. It energizes me. I like that. But when I'm at a party with a shit ton of people, it also energizes me. So I don't know if I'm one or the other. Yeah. It's a spectrum. I think so many things are a spectrum. I think it like we all try to like put people in like a box mm. so and you think so many things are in a spectrum i'm deaf i am more definitely on the introvert side of the spectrum but doesn't mean that i don't have extrovert at moments uh -huh. i guess uh -huh. yeah that's why i had to like rephrase earlier because like the way i worded it like was oh yeah i'm an introvert because when I spend too much time with a group of people, I feel like I'm drained. Well, that can actually apply to like a lot of people. Sure. All right. So that's why I had to rephrase that a little bit. But if you, so say like on the spectrum, where do you think you are in terms of like extrovert being, I'm more energized so when I'm feeling like I need to recharge. Do I recharge my battery with a group of people more often or do I recharge being by myself more often? I would ask a different question. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of Sherry Turkle. She's a professor at MIT. She wrote some unbelievably awesome books. I have one of her, I have her memoirs here. Um, so she wrote uh, Alone Together, uh, um, uh, Conserving Conversations, and this, you know, The Empathy Diaries, which is her memoirs. And, uh, and, and other books too. But these are the ones that, I, that I've read. I've read two of them and the third one I just got to read. Sherry Turkle quoted uh, Emerson and Thoreau all the time in her books. And one of the things that Thoreau did, he, he would live uh, uh, in the forest, right? Like in the, in the middle of nowhere and then Emerson would, would live nearby and then Emerson would come over and, and so on. So there's this concept of three chairs it's the, the chapter's called Three Chairs in this book that Sherry Turkle wrote. And the concept is, in, in Thoreau's house, he always had three chairs. That's it, three chairs. Why? One chair was for him. A second chair was for when someone would come over, he would sit like this. But usually n never more than one person came over his house. It was just Emerson. Like no, nobody really, he was his mentor. So nobody else ever visited him. So, the, so the, the question was like, why do you have a third chair? And the third chair was for community, right? It was like a representation, a symbol of community, of, of the tribe. 
And in Creating Conversations or Conserving Conversations, one of those uh, titles, I don't remember now, but it was a great book. Sherry Turkle said that in order for us to have valuable conversations with people, we must get good at being alone. Mm -hmm. Like really good. Like be comfortable with yourself. And, and, and I know that a lot of people aren't, right? Like, for example, my dad. My dad is terrified of being on his own. Terrified. He's so terrified that one time my mom was, uh, she needed like some medical checkup and they needed to keep her overnight. So my dad went to the hospital and like sat there because he was so scared to be alone at home. And he's never for a single night of his life been alone. Right. So I know there's people like that. Like my dad is like, that. so my understanding of this is it's not like introvert, extrovert, like, what do you get more energy? It's you got to be good at both. Mm -hmm. And you can only be good at one by being good at the other. Mm -hmm. And by good, I mean, like, you know, there's people at parties who are just like talking to everyone, but they're not connecting with anyone. There is no real like vulnerability and transparency. They're like the mayor, right? They're like, hello, 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 hello. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have a deep connection with yourself, there's like self-awareness and you're great being on your own, then you can have valuable conversations with other people. This is what I've learned. Do you think um, people are born the, with certain preferences or is that something that like, they develop as they grow older? Do you think I was born being like, I like to be by myself more than with other people. Or do you think it's because I was by myself a lot more? That's why I, I prefer that. And hence, that's why I feel like I'm an introvert. And I how, that's where I her. I don't know about... Huh, so you think like we have to... Okay, I get what you're saying. Like we should be good at both, right? Having conversations... I wouldn't use the word should. Yeah. Right? Like, for example, um, there are really great scientists and artists yeah. and, and, and uh, uh, you know, programmers, right? All sorts of people who suck at social interaction. Yeah. So I wouldn't go up to them and say, oh, you should be good at this. No, no, no. Brother, like... Go and develop, you know, Facebook. It's great. Like, go go do it, right? And, or, or, or go and develop this, this amazing thing you're doing. And, you know, you'll provide value for the world. And, and that's okay. Like that, I mean, there's, even if you look at autism spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yesterday I was watching a bunch of vid videos in the, in the, and mm -hmm. this is what they do, right? Rocking. And when I was in Toronto, I, I was a volunteer at an autism clinic. So I got to deal with, kids and so someone with autism who likes to be on their own and they get petrified of people i would never say you should because hey that's okay that's okay and to answer your question about the perhaps the genetic influences yeah. of of introversion and extroversion i have not read any studies on it like specifically like the genetic basis of it but i would hypothesize that there is some genetic predisposition to introvertedness or extrovertedness. And I know this because some of my friends who grew up in an introverted society, like a Russia or a Poland or a Ukraine, right? Um, when they left and came to America, they became extroverted. Because there is this interaction between your environment and your genes. Right? The genes impact the environment the imp and the environment impact the genes, right? Epigenetics. So if you give yourself the chance yes. for those genes to turn on and off, mm -hmm. then I believe an introverted person can go towards extroversion yeah. and an extroversion, an extroverted person can go toward introversion. Yeah. 
But I think, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I definitely feel like it's a spectrum. And I think, like, it also goes through phases, right? I still do believe that looking at a lifespan, I feel like there is, like, still a tendency to be a little bit more of one than the other. But, yeah. I'm sure, like, we all became, like, I shouldn't say that. I was about to say, like, I'm sure... There are many of us that became extroverts after the pandemic or after the lockdowns. Oh my God. Or, or, or deeply. Or deeply <laughs> become yes. like, I actually don't, this feels actually uncomfortable to talk to people now. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. A lot of the, a lot of the work in the hormone field, like if you look at testosterone or cortisol or even estrogen, I don't know enough about female hormones to comment, but we know that when you undergo any dramatic change in a important hormone like a testosterone, it's not like you become aggressive now. Yeah. It's like, oh, oh, now I'm extroverted. No, no, it's not like that. It's whatever you were, you become more of it. So if you're a peaceful person, you become more peaceful. Yeah. If you're a generous person, you become more generous. Because the whole point is to maintain your status. And if you believe something indicates what your status is, you're going to preserve it. And I know that still, like if you, you haven't been to Merida lately, but in Merida, they're still wearing masks. Everybody on the streets, for God's sake. And uh, if, you, if, if there's an introverted society and wearing masks allows you to become more introverted, oh my God, hallelujah. Thank God for the pandemic. Now, now I don't have to show my face to anyone. So this is, um, tell me what excites you now? Like in the moment, you know, we talked about purpose and passion and all sorts of stuff, right? The, what you're born to do and gifts and all that. And we talked about the empathy and, and how I feel very comfortable talking to you. And, and, and I get the space that you've created. I'm in it. I love it. Is there some project or cer certain uh, um, change that might happen in the near future that you're excited about? <laughs> right. Currently, I guess um, I'm thinking about my nighttime rituals a lot. I'm not going to overthink. I tend to like sometimes overthink questions and answers. So without overthinking and thinking too deeply, deep overthinking it, what excites me is about, uh, yeah, my nighttime rituals. Because um, I feel like I have my morning rituals pretty down. Every day you do it. Yeah. Every, every morning. At this, that's the thing. I think with rituals and routines too, you have to give it a little bit of flexibility. Okay. You know, you want to. You don't want to give yourself a hard time if you did like ten minutes versus a twenty minute, uh -huh. you know, time like journaling, whatever. So to to take us through that, what is the morning routine now? Um, or wake up early enough, whatever that is for you to carve out time in the morning before you get your day, other day responsibilities and duties rolling. So for me, that's like around 5.30 or 6. And what I would do is three, four simple things. Um, it would be exercising, right? Just exercising, whatever that is. For me right now is a jog, yoga, and some either HIT or GRX. So that's in the morning. The next thing is journaling. And the final thing, <laughs> the final thing is like just preparing for the day. Like it's, it's actually a part of, I guess, my morning routine. Um, so those three things. Like a to-do list? Like a to-do list. Um, but I do it every single morning. But that also includes anything that's like personal as well, not just like work. I think work has its own thing it's more like of a personal to do remember like a little reminders too i guess it's part of the journaling thing um so that's usually my morning routines and rituals but then like the nighttime one i don't have that habit at all right now and i feel like um i think some of us know that you know, your day starts the night before. 
I spoke about this with Marta. Even Marta was like, yeah, as soon as I prioritize sleep, my day is so much better. So yeah, like my sleep has always been like not super well, you know. How do I know? Because I wake up still still feeling very tired usually. Even if it's like I get a lot of hours, hours of sleep. So I really want to prioritize that and I want to like um, document that process for myself and maybe possibly share it with other people. And journaling again takes like president you know i want to get that nighttime journaling ritual down and i think maybe instead of like going through my win misses and what i can can improve in the morning i do that at night and just kind of like let let all those uh, things out of my mind so i can have a more restful night another thing i want to be a part of that is like a, a sleep elixir of some sort really yeah yeah Maybe have like a sleep recipe. I'm really in that. I really want to get into this right now because I feel like it could be a game changer for how my day goes, right? If I can really get a good nice sleep in it day, night after night, like I feel like that could really change things for me. So that's kind of what I'm excited about these days. Is this why you asked me about the supplement thing? Yeah. That's why you asked. I had no idea. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any insights so far? Have you tried anything that worked or worked this better? This also kind of came about-ish uh, without revealing too much. Like the agency mm -hmm. that I, I work with, mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of direct-to-consumer brands that they work with, com uh, consumer packaged goods and whatnot. So some of... Mm, 90% of their clients are in like the, some of like wellness industries and like supplement and whatnot. And so I'm learning a little bit more about magnesium, learning about, you know, different Magnesium L3 on eight. Exactly. These things. I was at, in a client meeting and they were comparing themselves to Calm. I just happened to have like a jar of Calm next to me, magnesium. And then they were just pointing out uh, why theirs was better than theirs in terms of like the combination, the the the, the mix of magnesium that they use, and I found it super interesting because I was starting to use Calm to actually like as my nighttime drink really? before I go to sleep. Yeah. I never tried it. Yeah, I mean, I felt like it worked until like they pointed those things out, and I I'm like, oh, interesting. Maybe this could be elevated. <laughs> uh huh. So yeah, like it's it's just a combination of like me never really having like good night's sleep for a long time. Um, me feeling that, okay, my routine, like my morning routine is that it is a habit that I have now. Mm -hmm. So what else can I do so that like my day can be better? I'll tell you from my experience sleep wise. So when I, I lived in Las Vegas for a year, 2013 to 2014, and I was sleeping at 6 a.m. every day because we were clubbing every night, go out every single night, seven days a week. And we would come home, you know, 5 a.m., 4.30, 5 a.m. And I would go to sleep at 6 a.m., wake up at 12, like every day for a year. So my routine, it, it was sort of like an undergrad when we would start our programming assignments at midnight, finish at 6 a.m., turn it in, go, to, go home and sleep, right? This was like a sort of a programmer uh, life, which was also in Las Vegas. So my sleep really took a toll. You know, my skin was getting messed up and my, my energy levels and I was drinking coffee. And then once, I guess there was a moment when I completely transformed how much I cared about my health, okay. right? So I was like, okay, what is there? What are the top maybe three sort of uh, overarching subjects that can help health? And sleep was number one. By far, more than diet, exercise, breath work, forget about all that, sleep. And right now, the thing that helps me the most, because because it's my sleep game has changed because I'm about to, I want to, I want to set this up because it's, uh, because it, because the, there's a, there's a nuance here because my mom is a very good sleeper and I'm also a very good sleeper. I've always been. I just chose 
to sleep in a weird way, to mess it up. So I've always, genetically, I have the genes to sleep well. I know that. However, nowadays, and this is shocking to me even, but Catherine, I'm sleeping at eight and I'm waking up at three. For the first time in my life, I thought waking up at five was like, wow, wow, I'm waking up at five. I'm so cool. Now, without any alarm, I'm waking up at three. Like today I woke up at three and I was here. I was, you know, doing my work. And uh, sometimes it's like 3.30. just depends. Maybe if I go to sleep at 8.30, it'll be 3.30. And, and max it's like four. But if I'm ever waking up after four, it's late. I'm shocked. Like what the hell happened to me? What happened to my body? And the key is routine. Seven days a week, I have the same routine. I wake up, I'm here working. Seven, I'm at jungle gym. And weekends it's eight because they, they don't open at seven. Then at jungle gym, it's breath work, ice bath. Workout, come home, breakfast. Go to digital jungle. Come home, have dinner, you know, have coconut water at digital jungle, have some snacks. And at 7 p.m. is the deadline. Screens have to be off. I mean, maybe also genetically, you just like have very, very good discipline. Like I know you two have like incredible discipline and maybe that's like learned and, and, and adapted over the years or maybe it's, it's passed on. I'm not sure what the science is around being disciplined. I was thinking that like, you know, what are the things that give me bad sleep? Um, eating too late you know, being on the screen, why am I doing those things? Maybe I'm a little bit bored. Maybe I want to entertain myself, you know? So if I have like a, if I have a ritual at night that I look forward to as much as I look forward to the morning ritual, like in the morning, I'm like waking up, um, looking forward and actually getting excited to do the things that I, uh, that I want to do. So I want to like formulate, try different things for nighttime so that I'm actually looking forward to it. So like if it's, if I love candles, for example, I would be like, okay, 8 p.m. Say for example, 8 p.m. I'm lighting my candle. That would be like a trigger for me to be like, okay, this is, this sets off my nighttime ritual. I'm doing something that I look forward to and enjoy so that I could make that a routine. Um, and over time. So you, you get prepared. I get prepared for it so that I don't like 8 p.m. comes around. I don't go over to the fridge and like, what else do I have to eat? Or like go on my phone or something like that. Yeah, so I have to replace those things that I kind of like tend to reach for that will give me poor sleep with things that I, that I, that I enjoy and make that into my nighttime ritual. So having a habit at night and then the melatonin production will 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 be prepared it'll it'll start you know from the candle light and and having all the other lights off you know or dimming it so you prepare yourself to go to sleep yeah i'm going to romanticize it i'm going to romanticize that the heck out of it so i look I, forward to it every day yeah i really wish that on on you Catherine. <laughs> like 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 i do on everyone else cuz i know the difference between good sleep and bad sleep is like a, it's a transformation. It's a, a, after people fix their sleep. Yeah. It's, it's like the whole world changes. Yeah. And um, like, you know how I told you about the van trip, right? Um, actually, ironically, like I slept great even though it was like in a van. Mine is like, if it depends on like the climate. Sometimes it's like just really, really hot. But I really just slept with like the circadian rhythm, right? Like the sun goes down, you sleep, there's nothing to do. Sometimes you don't have internet. <laughs> and then you just go to sleep and then you wake up before, like just when the, the sun rises. So that was great. But for most of us with our day-to-day -day schedule, like, you do need to put a little bit of effort to giving yourself a good sleep. So that's what I'm excited about these days. Love it. Love it. <laughs> and uh, that's why I love your no caffeine thing. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it, it was uh, we had cold brew every day because 
the in Merida the the sort of the uh, arrangement we had with our co co living people is that they would give us coffee every day for free, like at the cafe downstairs. So we were getting this amazing cold brew, homemade, and we both love cold brew. So it was like everyday heaven, cold brew, you know, freshly brewed stuff. Um, yeah, the the caffeine thing is not so much a sleep. It's more like I don't want to be addicted to a substance. <laughs> I don't want to like depend on this thing yeah. called caffeine or coffee in this case, because I mean, I'm still having like cocoa, right? I'm still having the dark chocolate and stuff like that, which has caffeine, but a little bit. Um, but one, uh, one question that I really want to ask you and, and then, you know, we'll wrap up because I know um, you have to go kickbox and kick some ass. Um, what sort of, um, People who are struggling in life, right? We, we mentioned depression, mentioned trauma, and we mentioned this uh, forgiveness and gratitude. Is there any specific advice, suggestion you would give someone if they're going through a difficult time and if they don't know where to turn to um, and, and they're just lost? Well, that's heavy. <laughs> I can only speak to uh, what I did when I was during when I was in a moment in my life when I felt those things that you just mentioned, including like thinking to myself, you know what, I'd be okay if I don't even wake up the next day. You know, and then also feeling a lot of shame around um, maybe not living up to my parents' expectations. So a lot of those things that you said plus this. So what did I do? And I'm I I hesitate to like advise people to do this because everybody's different. But before I reached out to anybody professionally, which I actually haven't, um, but I spent a lot of time by myself in solitude. So for me, that really helped because. Like I said, if I, even if I spoke to someone and they asked me how I'm feeling, I wouldn't even be able to tell them. I don't think I've even taken the time to really dig, dig deeper. So I think in those moments, in that moment in my life, I, I carved out like a month, actually. I know, I know not everybody can, can do this, but that's what I did. I carved out a month of my time just to be by myself. Um, in solitude, not meaning like a zero contact with people, but like there's some interaction when you go to the grocery store or whatever, right? Um, but allowing myself to ugly cry, allowing myself to like journal a lot, um, just brain dump, morning pages, stream of consciousness, whatever you're feeling, um, meditating, moving the body in a kind and gentle way. So yoga, a lot of yoga. And just at least release some of that somatic energy that you're holding before I started to like have conversations with close friends or, or whatnot about whatever's going on. Because I'm also someone that could be influenced by people that are very close to me. So I want to make sure that I have a certain level of clarity and awareness before I actually like have these kind of conversations with people. So that's what I did. That really helped. That's uh, amazing. It's amazing. Just being in solitude. And that's a very different word than lonely. Yeah, absolutely. It's very intentional, super intentional. And it's hard. Because being in solitude can lead to feeling lonely. Just... All right. But, um, but um, ultimately, like, you do want to reach out to people once you have that certain level of clarity and awareness. So just so that you know, it's just so for you to know that you are not alone. You know? What also helped was, like, even during that time of solitude, I didn't just disappear. I did tell people, this is where I am. This is what I'm doing. 
So even though I didn't talk to people, I would get messages from certain people in my life, just wishing me well, checking me in. Even though I don't respond, they just check in. So just knowing that you're not like alone. I was very fortunate to have that. I know maybe some people don't. Um. But know that you got your back. Have that time to yourself and like have that realization that like you know, I I got my back. There's a greater force than you are taking your back to spirituality. That they've got your back. It it has got your back. Yeah. Wow. It's a great place to end. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, uh, thank you for traveling here and a lot of gratitude to you for this time and you you poured your heart out, you know, you just were so real and no matter what the outcome is, it's uh it's great to to just to share space with you and be with you and communicate and connect. So thank you so much, Catherine, for your time and just your love. I feel it. I just feel your gratitude. And thank you so much for having me. It was so fun. Time went by so fast. Yeah. Thank you.